Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. All right, girls. I want to uh, share a word with you around one of my favorite women in the Bible this evening. Her name is Hannah, and her story is found in the book of 1 Samuel. I think actually Hannah was probably the first woman that I ever spoke of um, when I became a minister and a preacher. It was the first word about a woman of God that God had given me to share at a women's conference. And I feel like she's having a comeback. This is her comeback tour. There's something about her story that God wants to really seal and amen again today in this generation. The title of my message is this, Provoked, Processed, and Promised. So I wanna just start by reading the story. And I, what, I, what I wanna do today is I want to, you know when you're looking at a map and you're in a mall and it says you are here? I think that we're gonna have a little bit of a you are here location tonight. So we can kind of take the next step on the journey with God. So you ready? I'm just going to start reading, send out the word, and we're going to see what God's going to do, okay? 1 Samuel chapter number 1, starting in verse 1, the very beginning. Now there was a certain man of Ramathium, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, and Ephraimite. Wow. And he had two wives, very greedy, You only need one. Just ask my husband. (laughs) The name of one was Hannah and the name of the other, Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Okay, so insert drama here. And this man, Elkanah, went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrificed to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. He was a good man. Elkanah was a good, righteous man. Also, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And I'll get, to, I'll get to why that little tidbit is thrown in where it is. We'll get to that. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But, somebody say but. but. To Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. Interesting. God is outing himself in this story. And her rival, Peninnah, Hannah's rival, the mean girl in the house, provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when Hannah went up to the house of the Lord that Peninnah, her rival, provoked her, tormented her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. Every every family, every year, every every godly family was required to go to the temple to bring their family and their offering and celebrate and give God thanks for everything he'd done. And so they're going to church They're going for a celebration. They're going for a feast. Everybody's pumped out of their marbles. They're getting ready, fun and holy, fun and holy. (laughs) But but Hannah, everybody else is celebrating. Everybody else is high-fiving each other over what the Lord had done. But Hannah's turning up to church, but she's got a cry and a grief and a desperation on the inside of her life, in her heart, because of an unfulfilled desire and an unfulfilled promise and a sense of hopelessness. Does anyone in that room know what, it's feel like, what it feels like to maybe come to a cherished night and everybody around you is having the greatest time and dressed up and looking fly and <laughs> celebrating and line dancing, but on the inside there is a grief over something in your life that doesn't look the way it should. Quite often, as Christians, we can become very obsessed, understandably, with outcomes, we, we, like, we like the miracle. And, uh, and uh, listen, this is nothing against miracles. We need them. We see them. We, we, we are desperate for them. Yes, wonderful thing. But I have found that God is obsessed about the process, the journey. 
the reason this is, it because, is because it's actually the process, it's the journey that sharpens you, matures you, readies you, and postures your heart to be able to, to, be able to properly hold the miracle when it comes. I wish there weren't journeys in life. I wish there wasn't a process. I wish there wasn't such a thing as a bad season, that we just had bad days. But right here, we see Hannah in the midst of a horrific season, and it seems to me that God is allowing it. Not once, but twice. If it was once, we could maybe just put it down to the translation. But twice in this story, it says that the Lord had closed her womb. God was allowing her to walk through this barren season. And to make matters worse, she's surrounded by a woman or probably a whole lot of other women who have what she doesn't have and what she desperately wants. (laughs) And not only that, one of these women, the one who happens to live in the house with her, Peninnah, whose name ironically means pearl, torments her because, what of, because of what she has and what Hannah doesn't have. So she's in this vice of depression and her husband loves her, but it's not enough because there's a grief on the inside of her heart and she's being provoked and some translations say tormented, which tells us there's some kind of demonic energy around this situation. And she's turning up to church She loves the Lord. She knows her husband loves her, but there's a a broken heart on the inside of this woman over an unfulfilled desire of something that I have to imagine she knows is her portion for the future. There's an unsettledness on the inside of her. Peninnah's name means pearl. How many people know how a pearl is made? Through agitation, through irritation, through all the annoying stuff that we don't want to deal with that kind of culminates in, you know, like this sharpness and this unpleasantness and then it results in a treasure of great price. Who would have thought that Penina, the tormentor, the rival, would actually be used by God in order to create a priceless treasure in Hannah's life. We're going we're gonna to get to the end of the story and you'll see what that is. But maybe some of you have experienced a rival in life. I know I have. Many of you have heard my story, my testimony about how I got married at the age of 17 and went straight into ministry. And I was raised in a really beautiful home with a mum and dad who loved me and loved each other and loved the Lord and took me to church. And I definitely had rose-coloured glasses on when it came to ministry. And I moved nations after getting married at 17, moved from Australia to New Zealand. And within, I don't know, about a minute, I realized (laughs) that ministry and sometimes ministers and people in the church were mean. I remember thinking to myself, this is going to be amazing. We're going to be best friends. We're going to babysit each other's children. We're going to braid each other's hair. We're going to spend weekends together. We're going to sing Kumbaya. But very quickly, this woman made it her mission to try to grind me into the dust. As a 17-year-old woman that then grew into a 19-year-old who fell pregnant with her first child and having that baby and turning up in church and having this little guy at three days old in the church service and you know, just feeling like I want to be there to show everybody that I'm committed. And uh, this woman walked up to me when I'm holding little Geordie in my arms and she said, put your baby down. Put that baby down and keep it in the, in the stroller. There are women in this room who have had miscarriages and you're rubbing it in their face. And so this was, this was just kind of like some of the antics that I was experiencing. I remember being in despair, kind of like Hannah is. Other people were turning up to church and they had their miracle stories and they had their great friendships, but I would turn up most of the time in tears, especially thinking because I thought this was my lot in life. I love this man. He's a minister. He's called to be a minister, so this is going to be my portion forever. I hate my life. And I remember in the midst of that, lying on my bed and crying out to God. And it was in that moment that the first thing, that provocation, I was provoked to kind of like reconcile and reckon and wrestle with God what my purpose was in life. See, when we experience a rival, we can let it 
send us to bitterness and hopelessness and disappointment and despair and become somebody we're not, or we can actually let it provoke us to break through, to actually having an encounter with God. And for me, that encounter looked a little bit like this. This woman who was horrible, miserable, mean, tormenting, I believe, demonically assigned in order to grind me into the dust. I remember lying with God. I was on the bed and and speaking to God just in despair over my situation. And the Lord spoke to me and said, Leanne, you can either let this break you or if you trust me, this will be the making of you. And he said, I allowed you to be in this situation in order for me to reveal your purpose. You see who she is? I know your future. I know the places you'll go, the women I've called you to build, the ministry I've called you to to, uh, create and, and minister into. And in order for you to become the person that I need you to become, to become the steward of what I have in your future, I have, you have to allow me to take you through this process to show you what horrible looks like. So when you get to the other side, you say to yourself, Father, never let me forget how this feels, so I never do it to anyone else. Instead of letting your rival turn you into somebody you're not, why not let your rival show you who you are? I'm not like you. I'll never be like you. Thank you, God, for the gift of this persecution because it revealed to me who I was meant to be. I was meant to be the complete opposite of that. I was meant to be an encourager, a releaser, a woman who believes in people, a woman who draws others up, who binds the devil on their behalf, who prays for them, who puts courage and strength on the inside of them. And Hannah had this same experience. She had this experience with God. Somewhere in the midst of that, she wrestled with God as this woman was tormenting her about who she wasn't and what she didn't have. And she had to go to God and ask the question, who am I, what is my purpose and what did my, does my future hold? And that's where I believe God put the spirit on the inside of her or the dream on the inside. Hannah, you're meant to be a mother. Sometimes our worst rival and our worst day and our worst seasons of persecution actually reveal our future if we can get the hopelessness out of the way and find God in the midst of it. Out of the tales of the most, the most wicked, evil tragedies come the most incredible stories of triumph. Don't be bested by your rival, whether they be an actual person. I think many of you, maybe like Hannah, it could be an unfair situation or an unfair hand or, or some kind of injustice Don't sit down and settle. Look to God. Father, what do you say about my future? What do you say about what my purpose looks like? What do you want to teach me through this season and through this journey? So it revealed her purpose, who she was meant to be. Not only did Penina, the pearl, provoke her and torment her, so she wept and didn't eat, but even her own husband. And so I want to kind of like, I want to round this out a little bit. Because her husband comes to her, and he's a beautiful guy. He loves her. He clearly favours her. He's giving her a double portion while Mean Girl Penina's just getting one. Which kind of is a little bit of justice in this story. But then Elkanah, her husband, comes to her and says this. Look at 1 Samuel 1 to 8. Then Elkanah says to Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Why do you feel hopeless? Am I not better to you than 10 sons. Now, now can we just for a second, just take a moment to gaze upon and marvel at the ego of a man. I mean, it, it, it actually really is quite astounding. So, and, and look, he's not trying to be arrogant. He's not trying to be sarcastic. He's genuinely trying to comfort her. But what is he saying to her? Hannah, just settle. Just settle. Hannah, you know what? You've got a really great life. But what I love about Hannah is the Bible says, then Hannah arose. Hannah, and some of you need to hear this today. People are telling you to settle. Some of them are, some of you are experiencing rivals and mean girls that are trying to grind you into the dust. Don't let them. They will reveal your purpose if you run and filter it all through God instead of through pain and hopelessness. But then there are even people in your world that will be just saying, just settle. 
Look, look how good you got it. Just be content. But there was something on the inside of her that knew this isn't how it's supposed to look. God revealed my purpose to me. I know that I'm meant to be a mother. And as much as you love me, and as much as you've given me a double portion, it's not enough. I refuse to settle. God has put a dream in my heart, and I am going to pursue it. Somebody give God a shout today. Some of you have been tempted, and you have almost, people have almost tried to comfort you into settling. Just calm down. Stop believing. Look, look at you with your faith. Oh, you're pretty, you're too big for your boots. Look at you, look at your life. Oh gosh, greedy. Well, look at everything you have. Or look at, look at this or look at that. But when God has put a dream in your heart for something that you know has yet to be fulfilled, but he placed it there, girls don't settle. Do not settle. There is something on the inside of Hannah that is compelling her not to settle. Is that you today? I'm telling you, you don't want to live your life at the end of your life with the regret over what you didn't believe God for. The second thing that happened in this process, she figured out her purpose. I am meant to be a mother by hook or by hook I by crook. I'm not going to settle. I'm not going to let my rival torment me anymore. I'm not even going to let my well-meaning husband with the enormous ego get me to, <laughs> to, to be comforted and to settle. I am believing God. I know he put a dream in my heart. And some of you today, I want to speak prophetically. Vision Sunday, you wrote things on your card and then you read them back to yourself through the year and you said, wow, that was lofty of me. Look at what I wrote and thought in a moment of hype in a service. Well, I, that's a lie. God put that in your heart. That's a God dream. Don't talk yourself out of it now that you may be out of an atmosphere of faith. What, what dream did God put in your heart as it relates to, to you, to your mental health, to, to your health, to your children, in your relationships, your future, all the things that matter to you? What did God speak? Don't talk yourself out of it. And don't be talked out of it. Amen, Leanne. All right. I will drink to that. The second part of this journey is really beautiful. Hannah became a woman of prayer. She learned to release her cares to the Lord. The Bible says that the Lord had closed her womb twice. So at some point, Hannah had to reckon with the fact that God was involved in this story. She had a unique story. But she must have come to the conclusion that if God closed my womb, he can open it again. <laughs> Everything that is impossible with man is possible with God. So look what happens. 1 Samuel 1, 9 to 11. So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me. Can I just tell you, ladies, this is everything that God wanted from her. He was waiting for this precious daughter to come and ask him. And ask him. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, I has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered into the heart of man, the good things that God has in store for us. So here she comes. She's getting it. She's realizing my misery is not creating any great fruit. She realized the fact that I'm anxious and I'm not eating is not creating any great fruit. She realized the torment was not doing her any good. She realized the conversations with her husband in that sense weren't helping. So she finally went to the one being in the entire universe who was actually empowered to do something about her situation. And she released to him what she could not carry herself. There are times in life when what we're believing for is way too, way too big for us. And I say, listen, if you can't fix it, it's not your job to fix it. If you can't fix it, it's not your job to fix it. Now listen, I've tried it all. 
I've picked up the element and the tool of control many times in parenting as I was believing for miracles in the lives of my children, particularly my eldest son when he walked through drug addiction. I tried it all, my friends, and realized everything came up a loss. It wasn't until I came to the altar of God with the cry of desperation in my heart and poured out my complaint to the Lord that finally the torment and the depression was placed, replaced with peace. I handed into God's hands what I couldn't carry in my own. Do you know what prayer is? Prayer is a release. Prayer is warfare, yes. Prayer, we fight the good fight of faith. Prayer is making our requests known. But prayer on a very basic level is releasing to God what we can't carry ourselves. So what are you holding on to and trying to worry your way out of that actually just needs to be released to God in prayer. God, I give this to you. And what I love about Hannah's prayer is she was, it was, um, it was extravagant and it was specific. She didn't just ask for any old baby. She's like, Lord, if you would give me a male child. And she didn't realize that within her purpose and her desire actually was uh, inter intertwined with the purpose and the desire of God. Because God was looking for a woman who would give birth to a prophet that would be the anointer of kings and would be the namesake of two books in the Old Testament that outlasted even his part in those two books. That's how big and long and broad and magnificent his legacy would be. So within your prayer and your heart and your desire, it's actually an intertwining of what God wants to do through you. So she comes... And she pours out her complaint to the Lord. Many years ago, when Cherish Prayer started from this, I felt the Lord say to me, he said to me, Leanne, you have shown women what problems look like. You've, you've actually told them how to identify the things that don't look the way they should in their lives. Now I want you to equip them and empower them to change it. And they do that through prayer. And I, I still, I was still, all right, Lord, I'll preach a message on prayer. And then... A, a, a prophet by the name of um, Steve McCracken. And now listen, if you're going to be a prophet, you, I mean, the last name McCracken, I think you just, it was meant to be. It's like naming your kid Jeeves. They're going to be a butler, all right? If your last name is McCracken, prophet you will be. So he turns up to church and he's, you know, he's prophesying over everybody in the front row and the prophecies are just like flipping. You are going to cause revival across the entire earth, even galaxies yet to be created. And you are going to do this wild, crazy, incredible thing. And you and you. And then he comes to me and he goes, hmm. Hmm. He points his finger and he goes, and you, you are going to start a prayer meeting. And I remember thinking, sitting there going, and? go on. And then he moved on to the next person. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I don't want the prayer meeting prophecy. I don't want the prayer meeting prophecy. All the weird people go to the prayer meeting. Oh God. Ah. Give me any prophecy except the prayer meeting prophecy. But I knew it was the yes and amen from the Lord. And that's how Cherish Prayer was born, where we learned to shift things. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you permit and whatever you forbid, heaven will back you up. One of the tenets of Cherish Women's Ministry is we are women who pray. I have so many women who say, listen, I know I shouldn't complain, but I can't suffer in silence. Listen, no woman can. And God doesn't expect you to. That's why he gave us prayer. He's like, I know those, that female kind, my, my beautiful expression, they can't suffer in silence. So I'm going to give them a prayer language so when they're suffering, they cry out to me and I make the cries of their heart productive and powerful and bring forth a harvest of good things in their life. What are you worrying about that you should be praying about? James 5.13 says this, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Are you suffering today? Don't bottle that stuff up on the inside. You'll end up like Hannah, depressed and not eating. 
which tells me she must have had some anxiety in there too. Because listen, if I'm depressed, I'm eating. <laughs> I'm one of those people that's like, I'm sad. Where's the cookies? Where's the chips? Where's the salty, greasy thing? Anxiety is really the only way you will get me to stop eating. So this woman was depressed and she was anxious. But when she released her prayer to God, we're going to see this at the end of the story, something very powerful happened in her life. Release it to God. Prayer is a releasing to God what you can't carry. I want you to hear that today. You're burdened by it because you can't carry it. it it's overwhelming because you can't carry it carry it. It's too big for you. It's a daddy job. Amen, Leanne. Release it to the Lord. And this is, this is so beautiful. Look at this psalm, Psalm 73, 16. When I considered how to understand this, and some of you, you're going through things in life and you're experiencing things and you're going through your journey and maybe you're experiencing a rival in one shape or form and you're trying to figure things out. It says this, when I considered how to understand this, it was too great an effort for me and too painful until I came into the sanctuary of God and then I understood their end. There is peace and there is comfort for you in the house of God when you release your cares to the Lord, when you unburden yourself in the right way from what you are not meant to carry and say, God, I can't make myself pregnant. I've been trying for many years. But I know you put a desire in my heart and I know it's you. I know it's you and I can't fix it and I'm done trying. So I release it to you. I put it into your hands, Father, because I know that you can carry what is precious to me. Amen. And then the third thing that happens, oh my gosh, this is where the script starts to change a little bit and things get a little bit scary and a little bit angsty. And it happens to all of us. The third part of this journey, Hannah's journey, and you'll experience it in life too, is perseverance, learning to overcome offence. So she's doing the right thing at the right time. She finally gets up over herself and finds herself in the house of God, cries out to the Lord and brings her prayer, releases it to God. And look what happens next. You won't rightly believe it. 1 Samuel 1, 12 to 18. And it happened as Hannah continued praying before the Lord that Eli, the priest, watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart and only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli, the priest, thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you, woman. This is not Jersey Shore. <laughs> so ha Hannah's now facing what would be her final test. And this is the, this is the last the last pit stop of the enemy to, to abort mission before your breakthrough and your miracle is received. It, it's like, it's a classic and he doesn't have any new tactics. He just has new victims. And sadly, we fall for it every freaking time. But Hannah, I love Hannah's response. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 1, 15 to 16, instead of going, what did you say? What did you say? I read the Yelp reviews about this church and I should have believed them because you are a horrible man and how could you and you don't know what I've been going through and the torment and the pain and now I get here and I'm misrepresented and I'm falsely accused and people and not just any people, the flipping pastor accuses me of being a drunk. Most of you, I'm just saying, I don't wanna, I definitely don't wanna cast any dispersions tonight but I've been in ministry 30 years and I've seen a lot of things. Most of you will get your knickers in a twist and leave the church over it and maybe even throw God out too. Offense has been the greatest aborter of God dreams in the church, in the lives of Christians. Let me just tell you right now. A hundred percent and yet God allows it. And I told you I was gonna break down a little bit of that story where at the beginning, it says that when they came to the temple to bring their offering, that Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of the priests, were there. Why does the Bible make mention of that? It was actually showing us that there was a little bit of corruption in the leadership in this church. Like those two boys, those two men were wicked. They were sleeping with the women. They were stealing from the offering. But you know what? Elkanah and his family still turned up to church. 
still bought their offerings, still came on their pilgrimage, and still eventually sent their child to Bible college at that church. But we've got a generation right now that pulls their whole family out of houses of God because of idiots that God is going to deal with. It's not your job to police God's people like some kind of ghetto FBI. (laughs) The Lord is very, very good at dealing with His corrupt sons and daughters. And in fact, we'll go on to see in just a chapter that those two boys had a very bad ending. They both ended up losing their lives. The Lord killed them because of their wickedness. God is really good at taking care of that stuff. But, but can you imagine? Yeah, I know it happens. In the, in the New Testament too, you guys better be careful. So what I love about this story though, is it didn't change Hannah's behaviour. Didn't change Elkanah's behaviour. We're, we're in a time right now where, yes, there's corruption being exposed in pockets. Don't let it change you. Don't let it run you out of church. Don't let it take your family out of church and you're believing for this and you're believing that. But, but the devil gets you every time with offence and then you retract. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Pass the perseverance test in the journey of life. Learn to overcome offence. So Hannah says... <laughs> No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I ha- I'm not drunk. I haven't drunk wine or any intoxicating drink. I've purely just been pouring out my soul to the Lord. Don't consider me a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. She doesn't rebuke him. She doesn't slap his face. She doesn't say, how dare you? Bible tells us in Proverbs 19:11, a man's or a woman's insight gives them patience. And it is a virtue to overlook an offence. Too many Christians don't overlook offences, they look into them. And in the process, they engage in petty battles that are not theirs to fight and they miss out on the breakthrough that God wants to get to them and to their family. She was gracious in her response. And some of us just need to be gracious. People will put their foot in their mouth in church. It happens all the time. I did it last week. I remember having a conversation with somebody who had a daughter who had has red hair and I used an allegory saying yep they were like the red-headed stepchild yo doll my 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 <laughs> I didn't realize I'm like oh my gosh I just used that saying in front of someone who has red hair I want to die <laughs> and then I just tried to pretend like I did, like oh anyway so and you know ch- change the subject <laughs> but we do that you, do, you don't look at each other funny you guys have done that too and you just want the earth to swallow you up. You're like, oh, why did I say that? Most people aren't being on purpose offensive either. We're just thoughtless. We're just human. We say stupid things sometimes. Like, don't throw it in the offense basket too readily. And when it is a legitimate offense, hand it to the Lord. I'm not gonna let this derail me from my future. I'm believing for something big. I've got a miracle and a breakthrough with my name on it and nobody's kicking me out through something as petty as offence. I'm gonna be a person who forgives. So Hannah perseveres. I'm telling you, if you can handle persecution, you can handle increase. And God had increase and multiplication in mind for Hannah, but she had to withstand some persecution. He knew what her future was going to look like. He knew what kind of kind of woman he needed to be the mother of this great prophet Samuel. And she needed to pass through a couple of tests on the journey. And then finally, peace, a renewed disposition. At the beginning of the story, we see Hannah, she's depressed, she's not eating, she's tormented. And then at the very end, because she didn't run out of the house of God when she got offended, look what happens. 1 Samuel 1, 17. Then Eli, the priest, answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favour in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. This is a miracle. She's not yet pregnant. She's not conceived a child. Her situation hasn't changed on the outside, but she's changed. She's come to the house of God and gone on the journey and the process with God, released it to the Lord, overcome the offences, as many and as egregious as they may have been. 
And then she received something very powerful, a priestly prophetic amen on her prayer. The devil wants to get you out of the house of God because he knows out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established. He doesn't want somebody to amen your prayer, what you're believing for. He doesn't want somebody to stand with you in the community of faith saying, yep, we're believing your baby's gonna get off drugs. We're believing that this barren womb will be fruitful and, and we rebuke the devourer in the name of Jesus, you're gonna have a baby. He doesn't want that. He wants to get you out of there. But here she is. She gets an amen on her prayers. And then the one thing that she was lacking and really needing in this season is what is restored to her. Peace. Peace. Go in peace. And the Bible says she went away and her face was no longer sad. And then she went and had a meal. And then she went home and she made love to her husband. So there had been healing there. Healing, complete and total healing. This is why men shouldn't come to women's events. <laughs> Baby, only grandchildren for us from now on. But when you go on that journey with God, when you don't let the devil take you out with his whammies and his tricks and, you know, the people in church that can always, you know, often make our journey and experience so unpleasant, don't, don't be rattled by the noise and the explosion around you, continue to move forward with God. Look at the future with a smile. Release to God what you cannot carry. Overcome offences, walk through life with a gracious attitude and spirit. Stay in the house of God, get under the spout where the glory comes out. Wait for an amen for your prayers. Go in peace and release into the hands of God the things that only He can fix and restore. I'd love it if you'd stand to your feet. Over the process of time, Hannah conceived and bore a son and named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. Some of you are in the middle of your process, and I don't know where you locate yourself in that journey, but where you are right now is not your destination. It's just a place you're passing through. The Bible says, even though we pass through the valley of weeping, we shall make it a spring. How do we do that? When we walk through it with God. Don't stop walking. Don't quit, don't throw a tantrum, don't leave God's house, stay where you are, trust God, become a woman of prayer, lift your hands to the Lord, release things to Him that you cannot carry yourself. And I promise you, the signature of walking with God always, always ends with life. Hannah didn't only just have one baby, she had six babies in total. She got more than she bargained for right there. And some of you today are like, I just, I don't know. The process is tough and I'm in this dark place and all these kinds of things are happening. Just keep walking. Put one foot in front of the other with God and at the end, life, life. The signature of God is life. The Bible said that it was the thief, says that it's the thief that has come to steal, kill and destroy. But Jesus said, in case you're wondering what my signature is, it's life and life in abundance. So don't let go. Lift your hands to the Lord. Father, I thank You for these beautiful women. My God, some of them in journeys that seem so dire and so desperate. And today I even know there are women here and the depression and the anxiety have been so aggressive in your life that you've, you've actually contemplated ending your life. And the Lord sent me here today to tell you that's not gonna be your future. Your future is not death in despair. It's life in Christ Jesus. It's blessing. It's peace. It's freedom. God has an incredible future for you. Don't stay in despair. Give it to God. The Bible says He can give us beauty for our ashes. And some of you today have come with a whole bunch of ashes and you're walking around identifying with those ashes and God's saying to you today, will you come and will you leave him at the altar? Because I've got something really beautiful for you in exchange. That's you today. I want you to lift your hand to the Lord. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, the enemy has really used hopelessness as a weapon of mass destruction amongst God's people. Just lift your hands right now. Hi to the Lord. 
Father, I thank you right now. I break the power of that spirit of hopelessness in the name of Jesus. And I declare hope comes again. Again, Hope springs forth. Hope and anchor for their souls, Lord. Father, and I thank you for the joy of the Lord to bubble up from the inside out in them. God, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Father, you told us that you would leave us your peace. My peace I give to you. My peace I leave with you, not as the world gives do I give to you, but peace that overcomes all sorrow, peace that overcomes everything the world can throw at us, peace that surpasses all understanding. Father, I thank You right now for miracles in the journey. Father, little signatures, the signature of God that today, before they put their head on the pillow tonight, that they would see that You are at work in their story. If you're here today and you've been told that you can never have children or you've suffered uh, miscarriage and something of that nature and you wanna have some, you wanna have babies, I want you to run to the front right now. I want you to run, run, run. There's an anointing here. Whenever we speak about Hannah's story, there's an anointing. There's an anointing to pray for women who have been told that they're gonna be barren. I'd love it if some of the leaders could come stand with them. And if that's you, run, come in faith. Hannah's story is there as a testament to us of what God wants to do, not what just He did for somebody else, but what He can do. What's your name? Rita. Rita. Beautiful. Are you married? Beautiful. All right. Amen. Just lift your hands to the Lord, Rita. Thank you, Father, for Rita right now. I break the power of every negative word spoken over her in the name of Jesus. I declare life. I declare life. I declare life in her body, life in her womb. Father, I rebuke the devourer in the name of Jesus. And I declare she will be like a fruitful vine. I come against every attack of the enemy right now. Every word curse spoken. Even things she's spoken over herself. I take authority over those words right now and I cancel them. I cancel every demonic assignment. I break the power of every familiar spirit that has stopped up what God called to be open. Father, I thank You right now for life, life, life. Thank You, Father. And you know what? The journey's gonna start, Rita, in the way you speak over yourself. That's what I see. Something's going to shift as you just declare, like you cry out to the Lord, you hand it to Him, and you start to speak life over your body. Not cursing, not I'll never, this is never going to happen, it's impossible. Life, just speak life, life. I am a woman who was fruitful. I am a fruitful vine. God created me to go forth and multiply, and that I will do. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for her life and her future babies in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. Can I pray for you, sweetheart? What's your name? Esther. Esther, star, beautiful, beautiful, yes, Esther. Thank you, Lord. Stretch out your hands to Esther, ladies. Stretch them out. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful one, beautiful one. Esther, here's the word of the Lord to you. What the enemy meant for evil, God is gonna turn around for good. What the enemy meant for evil, God is going to turn around for good. Not only are you going to have children, but you're also going to adopt babies. I see lots of babies in your future, some that have come from your own body and others that haven't. You're going to carry other, you're going to hold other people's babies and nurture them and raise them as if they're ever your own in your hands. And God, God delights in you. But I see just a cycle that's come through the, the family line that we break and we take authority over today in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank You, God, and we take every thought captive into the knowledge of Christ today. And I just declare over Esther's life, Father, that she would be a champion just like her namesake. Father, she would be a deliverer just like her namesake. And Father, I thank You for those babies. In Jesus' mighty name, Amen, Amen. Somebody give God a shout. Is there anyone else? Just lift your hand if that's you. Come forward, all the ones we're going to pray for. Stretch out your hands, ladies. Beautiful. Are you here? Are you here for that, or is both of you? All of you? Okay, good. I'll do one at once. What's your name? Renee. Renee. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for Renee. Renee, the Lord absolutely delights in you. 
you're, you're a good woman. You're a beautiful woman. And there have been tears you've cried and seasons that you've walked through that uh, you felt very alone in. But I hear the Lord saying that you have actually never spent an alone moment in your life. He was with you the whole time. And so much so that He collects our tears in a bottle. That's what the Bible says. He collects our tears in a bottle. They're, they're so precious to Him. Your tears were so precious to Him. He saw the pain. He saw the wounds. He saw the seasons. He saw the words and heard the words that were spoken over you. And the Bible says that the Lord rejoices over us with singing. And I just know that the Lord is singing a new song over your life. And there's a scripture in the Bible that says, Sing, O barren, you who have not born, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman. And God's about to rewrite the song over your life. So the song had a level of pain and wounding and darkness interweaved into it, but the music's changing, Renee. The music's changing. The song over your life is changing. Father, I thank You for life. I thank You for babies, not just a baby, but babies. We pray a hannah size prayer. We declare today, God, what You did for Hannah, do it again. Do it for Renee. Father, what You did for Sarah, do it again. Do it for Renee. What You did for Rachel, what You did for Rebecca, what You did for Mary, Elizabeth, do it again. Oh God, we thank You for the miracle of not just a child, but children in Renee's life. And her story, her song would be like Hannah's song. She triumphed over her enemies and she said, my gosh, even the Baron has given birth to seven. A perfect amount of babies for her. I don't know if you want that many, but God is for you, Renee. God bless you, God bless you. What's your name? Tanya. Tanya, let's pray for Tanya. Stretch out your hands. Wow, beautiful, a beautiful anointing. Like Esther as well. You're gonna be a deliverer. You're gonna hold many children in your arms, many, many children. And the Lord has raised you up to be a mother. And there have been tears that have been shed and, you know, dreams that felt like they would never become reality. But I'm here to tell you that you're going to hold babies in your arms. You're going to hold babies in your arms. Three children, you're going to hold babies in your arms. Three babies, three babies. Oh, they're going to be the apple of your eye. You're going to love them deeply. And they're all going to be incredible world changers. Father, I thank you for her right now. In the name of Jesus, they thank you for that life and those lives that are coming into her life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What's your name? Mandy. Mandy. Let's stretch out our hands to Mandy. Thank you, Lord. The doctors are wrong. The doctors are wrong. The doctors are wrong. The doctors are wrong. A lot of doctors are correct, but this one is not correct. It's not you. It's just a process of time. In fact, you're going to have so many babies. I just saw a picture of you with so many babies on your hips and almost just like a little look of like a good level of fatigue on your face because you have so many children. So do not fret. Give me a hand. Fret not. The doctors are wrong. The doctors are wrong. It's just the Lord's timing. That's all it is. It's just the Lord's timing. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. This is just going to be a little bit of a trust test, but don't be afraid. Fret not. Babies are coming. <laughs> Babies are coming. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Is there anyone else before I end here? Beautiful, come here. What's your name? Kimberly. Stretch out your hands to Kimberly. Father, I thank you for beautiful Kimberly. Father, I thank you for life, life, multiplication. I bind every devil, every demonic curse, every spirit of intimidation. Father, what has been shut, we're believing for you to open, God. God. What is impossible with man shall be possible with God. I thank you for faith replacing fear tonight. I bind every spirit of fear in the name of Jesus that has tried to rob this beautiful woman. We command it to get off her life right now. For God has not given you a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and a sound, sound mind. Father, I thank you for healing every area, body, mind, and soul. Body, mind, and soul. And a lot of this is just, there's some mental things that God is gonna work out, some belief systems, some things you've thought about yourself and some things that you've thought about God that have been passed down and God is rewriting your story.
just look at me for a second. He loves you. God really, really loves you. And He's good. And He's going to show you that He's good. Amen. Amen. God bless you, beautiful. God bless you. God bless you. All right, just lift your hands to the Lord. If you're in the middle of a journey, if you're in the process, you are here. Don't lose heart. Stay on that potter's wheel. Stay in God's hands. Stay in God's house. Stay around God's women. Stay in faith. Fill your heart, your mind, your life, your car with the Word of God, with the praise of God. Father, I thank You for Lindsay Porter. Lindsay, just lift your hands to the Lord. There is a miracle coming to your house. <laughs> yes. And you might say, well, geez, it's taken a long time to get here, but it's in the perfect timing of the Lord. Over the process of time, Hannah conceived. And there was something that the Lord wanted to do. And there's something that the Lord has wanted to do in your family and in your life and in your heart. But there's a miracle. I just see the end is nigh. And sometimes the dark, well, the darkest part of the night happens just before dawn, just before everything gets brighter. Things are about to get really bright in your world, Lindsay. Really, really, really bright, really vibrant like Technicolor, it's gonna be blinding. It's so brilliant. And it's gonna be like X master spot and everybody will go, well, do you remember when Pastor Leanne prophesied that over Lindsay and oh my gosh, look at her life, wow. And your life is gonna be a testimony and a trophy of God's goodness. But what He's giving you at that time is He's building your faith muscle and your trust muscle because there was a season where you lent on fear, cloaked a little bit in wisdom and concern, but now God is making you a woman of faith and a woman of courage and faith and patience work together. So that's what God's been up to, but the end is nigh. The dawn is breaking, the weather's parting. I wanna pray for this little girl here and I won't take too much longer, I'm sorry, with the, with the tartan. Yes, lift your hands. Good girl, yes. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this beautiful one. Thank you for her life, her sweet, soft heart. There is a beautiful gift on the inside of you, a gift of God. You're gonna be a minister. You're gonna be a preacher. You're gonna do what I do. And, and right now it feels a little bit intimidating because, oh my gosh, like I can't even imagine. But guess what? I was you once. I would never have seen myself here. But God has put a really beautiful gift on the inside of you. And He's gonna work it out. You don't need to be in fear. You don't need to make it happen in your own strength. As you continue to walk with God, He's gonna unfold this beautiful life, this beautiful journey, but you are gonna be a pastor. And I'm gonna prophesy a pastor in this house, a pastor in this house. You're gonna bring light. You're gonna work with young people to begin with. That's always the trajectory, young people and youth and you're gonna be the role model, sometimes not the role model they want, but the role model they need. Because God's gonna give you a couple of things. He's gonna work on your confidence and your courage, and you're gonna have conversations with these kids that literally walk them off cliffs that they're about to jump off. And you're not gonna be afraid. The devil's tried to, to intimidate you through fear, but it was always a tactic because he knew what your future held. And he knew uh, that you would need to be a, a woman of courage and faith. And so he tried to bog you down in fear. But I break the power of that fear off your life in Jesus' Name. I declare God has not given you a spirit of fear, but one of power, love and a sound mind. You're gonna preach the Gospel. You're gonna set the captives free. This young generation needs you. The Lord has need of you. God bless you, God bless you. I'm gonna pray, pray for this woman right here with the hat on and the glasses in the aisle. Can I pray for you? Lift your hands. The Lord is so proud of you. He is so proud of you. All the tales you could tell, but you have been faithful on the journey with God. And at times it's hurt so deeply and you've cried and you've wanted to run out and people have truly offended you, like the real stuff, not the pretend stuff the real stuff. But time and time again, you have made a decision to give God your heart and give God your life. And I wanna tell you today, God is smiling at you. He's incredibly proud of you. When He looks at you, He smiles. You put a smile on the face of God. In fact, here's what I'm feeling, that God brags about you in heaven to the angels. 
look at her. Almost like Job. They threw everything at her. He tried all these books, all these schemes, but she's still here. She's still giving me a heart. She's still walking on the journey with me. And the Lord is so proud of you. And a reward is coming your way. And any reward from heaven is a reward worth waiting for. So God bless you, sweetheart. God really loves you and He's very proud of you. And I pray for one more for babies. I'm going to pray for you. Absolutely. I'm going to really quickly pray for this woman in the overalls. And then I promise I'm going to let you lion dance. Can I pray for you? Yeah. God's moving in your heart and your life. Is this your first time here? No, you've been here a few times. Okay. These are your friends around you? Yeah, God's working in an area of concern in your life. And what you're going through and walking through is not, it's, it's not invisible to Him. Like he, he sees it. Like He's not far off. He's not re- removed. The Bible says that He is a very present help in a time of trouble. And He wants me to tell you He's with you. He's going to bring you through. Even when it feels like the earth is shaking under your feet, don't be afraid. God's going to bring you through. And just like my friend up the front here, you're about to step into a beautiful, new, glorious day. Pretty soon, the weather's going to break, the wind's going to stop, the the rain's going to cease, and the sun is going to start to come out. And you'll be like, ah, there it is, there it is. Hope is being restored for your future. The Bible says of the Proverbs 31 woman that she looks at the future with a smile. And that's going to be your testament. Because there was a season and maybe you're kind of just coming out of it where you looked at the future and you didn't have a smile, you had despair, you had a frown. You felt hopeless, but God's about to rewrite your story. Your future is bright. You're going to look at the future with a smile because God is with you. God is with you. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. And really quickly, this woman in the green blouse with the long blonde hair on the aisle. Yep. Lift your hands. Yeah. Lots of women here tonight that God wants to speak to. Yeah. Thank you. Lord. Come forward, actually, sweetheart. Come let me pray for you. He pulled you out of a crowd because He wants you to know He sees you. He sees you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this precious daughter that you love. You felt alone. You felt overlooked. Does anybody see? Does anybody care? Does anybody know the pain that I've been walking through? And God simply asked me to point you out today to just tell you God sees. He's, He's here and He loves you and He's working on your behalf. And as you continue to surround yourself with these beautiful women and let them help you, I just see God is going to restore your smile and your laugh. I reckon you've you've got beautiful teeth, but I, I think you have a really beautiful laugh and God's missed your laugh. Your laugh's going to come back. Your laugh's going to come back. There's a woman in the Bible, her name was Sarah, and she actually named her son Isaac, which means laughter. And... I, I'm not saying you're going to have a physical baby, but God is going to restore laughter into your life. Joy, joy is coming back into your life. God loves you and He sees you. Yeah, you're very precious to Him. Very precious to Him. Let's stretch out our hands. Tell me your name. I'm Natalie. Natalie, you're beautiful. <laughs> I'm so happy to meet you. Father, I thank you for precious Natalie that you love. Father, I thank you for your love pouring out on her tonight that she would know from the top of her head to the soles of her feet how loved she is, that you're working in her life. Father, God, you're going to bring her through. And he's not just going to bring you through. He's going to bring you through in strength and with a laugh and with a smile. You just wait and see. You're going to have a lot to smile about and a lot to laugh about. God is with you. Thank you, Lord, for Natalie. Amen, amen, amen. Give me a hug. Yes. And you smell good too. Come here, sweetheart. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Stretch out your hands. What's your name, darling? Bailey. Bailey. Bailey's going to have babies. Bailey's going to have beautiful babies. I bind every spirit of infirmity that has tried to latch it itself on this young woman from her family line. We take authority over right now and we we cut the cord. We cut the cord. We break it right now. We cut every tie with any deal with the devil, with any assignment and agreement, with any spirit of sickness right now in the name of Jesus. we, We cancel it off her life. 
Now, you are a new, Bailey, you are a new creation. All things have become new. All things have become new. The old has passed away and God's doing something new in your life and in your body. And we're just declaring right now life, 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 life and multiplication. Life and multiplication. You're going to hold babies in your arms. You're going to be very fulfilled. And you're going to go on a journey with God. And it's going to be really beautiful. And it's going to be a wonderful process. And life is going to be at the end. And I just hear the Lord saying not to worry. He's going to teach you how to pray. He's going to show you how to live and how to speak in a way that builds life. But you've got an incredible future ahead full of all the wonderful things that you dreamed of when you were a little girl and the devil's not going to steal them from you. God is the restorer of life. He's the creator of life. He's the bringer of life. He speaks and life exists. Father, I thank you for this in Bailey's life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you, Bailey. God bless you. Lift your hands one more time and then everybody's going to line dance. I'm going to pass back to Pastor Loren. Father, I thank you for these ones. God, we pray for them tonight. Father, I thank you for courage and faith to rise. Father God, for them to see You in the journey of their life, that where there has been discouragement, hope comes, courage comes, faith and life and hope are restored again to Your daughters that You love. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Somebody shout Amen. Wow, what an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen. For more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.